Welcome, everybody. My name is Abby Lopez, and I'm with Dr. Jim Richards. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does such a great welcome like you do. <laughs> <laughs> when you're welcoming yourself, <laughs> you know, you got to do it right then. <laughs> there you go. Right. So, Dr. Jim, I... <laughs> I gotta calm down and be more serious. This topic is still continuing on the church matter. You've been talking about Rethink Church at the past session, which was very, very good, informative, and yep. really stirring our hearts. And if you didn't see it, let me tell all listeners, please check this and you can see right now, there is popping a link where you can click to that first session on Rethink Church, Understanding Times. I will tell you what, uh, latest researchers spoke my observation is that there have been uh, moral dysfunctions among let's say believers or christians right we don't like to use that in christian society let's say and it appears uh, that alcoholism substance abuse or domestic violence or sexual immorality is even more at churches than in regular uh, secular population can you talk about that you know, I, I think that most of those numbers are embellished. Okay. Uh, what I have found is that in the more the more legalistic a group of people is, mm -hmm. the more dysfunction they have, mm -hmm. and and so the problem is sometimes those numbers get put into the statistics to try to paint a, a bad picture of all believers. Mm. But I, I don't, I don't, th I don't, oh, okay. I would say that, well, I, I don't even know. I, I don't even want to make a speculation, but, but, right. uh, but, but I do, I do know this, th those numbers and those kinds of studies are always skewed against the believer. Mm -hmm. So you suggest not to believe this, not to listen. Right. It's just like the numbers that they put out about the, the numbers of divorce uh, uh, in, in among believers and Christian, I mean, and non-Christians. Uh, that number is padded. It is not accurate. It's not even close to accurate. You know, they're trying to say that that you know that inside of the church there's an over fifty percent uh, divorce rate. There's not. Those those numbers are not real. Wow! Thank you. This is amazing. I've never heard that. I would always hear people kept emphasizing, you know, yep. and stressing that point. Yes, watch what happened. And then you're right. It creates kind of fear in us. What happens to us? We're not strong enough. Well, and then, then there's a, a whole different problem as to why those numbers are skewed. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, who's defining what the church is? Who's defining what a believer is? They're not defining believers by biblical standards. They're defining Christians as people who might who, who have never been born again. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to church maybe Christmas and Easter. Uh you know, they don't read the Bible, uh, Jesus, you know, they have no real personal commitment to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, the world, that's why I hate the terminology Christian, because Christian is, as I always say, it is not a biblical term. It is a term uh, that, uh, the, that uh, the Gentiles used mm -hmm. kind of critically of the church, I believe it was in Antioch. Yeah. And so, the, but, but the reason I really hate the terminology Christianity or Christian is because, is because that is a word that has no biblical definition. Okay. Every term that God uses to describe who we are in relationship with him always describes some function, some relate, some aspect of the relationship. Like a, like, for example, you know, we know that, uh, uh, uh a person is born again has believed on Jesus as Lord and called on him, you know, to follow him as Lord. A person that uh, is, a, is a child, then this is a person who is born of God. A person who is a, an heir and a son is a person who, is, who has access to all of the resources of God and in their inheritance and can use it. A person as a disciple is a person who is building their life on the teaching and the modeling of the Lord Jesus. So, so you go through every biblical terminology that God uses about us, and it describes 
very explicitly, it describes some aspect of our personal relationship with him. But the word Christian means nothing. It has no biblical meaning. It is not a biblical word. It's used one time in the Bible by the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. That's so good. Very good. So, you know, this is uh, comforting a lot because even the righteous will fall seven times, but he will, the Lord will always lift us up when we have established our hearts in, in root, we are rooted in the word oh, of yeah. God. So immorality and everything that I mentioned before really doesn't exist among believers, true believers. Correct. Well, it doesn't exist in the rampant, exaggerated numbers that the secular world wants to pin on us because the secular world, it, you know, people mm -hmm. do not realize how aggressive mm -hmm. the secular world is against, okay. against Christians and Jews. And the secular world wants to, actually, the Bible teaches that the secular world is, is deliberately ignorant of things that they could know about God. They don't want to know these things about God, because if they know these things, if they admit the truth about God, then they have to stop their immorality. They have to stop their lying, their stealing, their cheating, all that kind of stuff. They have no intention of doing this. So one of the ways they kind of make it palatable is mm -hmm. by, by pointing at, at people and saying these Christians are doing the same thing we're doing so what's the difference you know ah uh, so this is kind of like a an attack on us oh it, it is an attack on us wow. and, and, and and you know you, you you also got to remember that wow. uh, you know the, the the and we'll talk a little bit about about the church and I even I hate using the word church because people don't know what it means mm -hmm. and uh but but you know the church as a whole uh is asleep mm -hmm. they are completely unaware of what's going on and what's really happening in in spiritual realms and what's and the attack that is coming against us and is growing day by day by day mm -hmm. wow and um, i will also ask you to talk about the approach of the prophetic wave that is coming i don't want to bash it completely i don't mm. want to say no because there are many great hearts that yeah. we will respect we honor these men of god but there is a wave of prof prophetic wave that's coming regarding end times but again see i'm trying to give you nuggets where i want you to go mm. today but talking about the church what about daily struggles? When I talk to believers that go to ch churchgoers, can I call it this way? Mm -hmm. They struggle with mostly authenticity. They hide behind uh, so many nice pictures that they post on social medias. And they will say, listen, I don't want to highlight bad. I will, hi yeah, I'm saying good. I will post on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else the, 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 the happiest moment of my life. But we know inside, yeah. Their life looks better. Can you talk about this uh, authenticity? Well, let's, let's, re let's recap something I think we talked about in our last video on Rethink Church. Mm -hmm. And, and every, every belief that we have mm -hmm. and beliefs emerge from patterns of truth. But beliefs, you know, we tend to think of a belief as an individual capsulization of one exact theological point of view but the real truth is beliefs of the heart are are more patterns that tie together like, like for example you know you know for example if, if i'm going to believe uh, uh god as a miracle worker then you know then, then that's got to affect how i see jesus it's got it's going it's got to be tied to what i believe about the death burial and resurrection it's got to be tied to the creation of the universe and so real heart beliefs are never just individual things. Now, you can have some individual beliefs, obviously, but the kind of beliefs that change their life, man, they are, they're life consuming. They, they're like a checkerboard mm -hmm. of, of things that are sprinkled on to our life that, that affect the way we see everything and think about everything. But interestingly, uh, when you get down to, what I would call isolated or individual beliefs, you start realizing that all beliefs actually emerge from the definition of individual words. Yes. This is so important. Yes, absolutely. So this means, and, and you know, the Bible 
I mean, over and over and over, the Bible talks to us about how we handle the Word of God, how we revere the Word of God, how we search the Word of God, and, you know, you know, and this this whole thing of of it being something so incredibly precious that we need to spend our life, you know, mining this out and find and, and bringing it into our life and discovering who God is and discovering what we have. So, <clears throat> but once you get a once you get a belief. Mm -hmm. uh then when every time you read a passage in the bible that has a particular that particular word in it then you, you very seldom slow down long enough to, to kind of remind yourself what does this really mean what am i really reading mm -hmm. and so if you don't do that then you, your your mind defaults to mm -hmm. whatever kind of religious ideology that you have come up with from the past mm -hmm. and so that means that you turn the truth into a lie mm. because because you're taking the truth you know and you're saying the right biblical word but you're redefining that word to mean something that the bible is not saying so how can i be sure that i am in uh, re reading only the bible outside of my own religious mm, thoughts well you know first and foremost you you've got to understand the absolute places where we can go to not get technical definitions of words as much as to to see if the words are in harmony with the pattern that God has woven about himself and you know I always say that now now and, and remember unfortunately when you, you know, we talked about this one time about a year ago and you know a few people lost their minds over it but, uh, you know, the first 2,500 years that man was on planet Earth, what we now call the signs of the Zodiac. And all of this terminology changed at the Tower of, the ba uh, Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. But prior to the Tower of Babel, what we call the signs of the Zodiac, and I can't even remember the Hebrew word for it, they, these constellations told the story mm -hmm. of what happened in the garden, what happened to the serpent, mm -hmm. and, and they actually go through every single phase of uh until jesus comes back mm -hmm. so for 2500 years all every human being alive knew the gospel story now it's really interesting somebody wrote in and we talked about this before so you're saying that you're saying that jesus is hercules i'm like that you know you, you're just sort of like you, you can't even know how to answer that kind of ignorance so it's like no mm -hmm. it was jesus and then the occult started mm -hmm. calling jesus hercules you yeah, know yeah. They, you know the occult changed it it was pure in its pure but but yeah so you had 2500 years of that well over time we lost our ability to see and notice and recognize those kinds of things mm -hmm. you know very probably mm -hmm. the uh the um uh, the sphinx in egypt is actually telling the story uh of of, of the beginning and the and the end mm -hmm. of this whole gospel presentation because mm -hmm. because one part of the sphinx, sphinx represents the very first uh picture in the in in the constellation and mm -hmm. then then the other part of the sphinx represents the very last picture of the line of the tribe of judah you know wow so mm -hmm. so yeah you know we had all that but you know we lost it because we stopped paying attention and so then because we are too religious and stuck up in our minds and we rather yeah. rather uh, uh, judge people that want to speak what you're saying yeah. than receive it mm -hmm. yeah people people don't even slow down and, and listen to stuff you know and uh, they in, don't in bother session, thinking yeah okay. in a session i was doing not too long ago Mm -hmm. I was I was sharing some things mm -hmm. and you know I do quite a few interactive sessions with people, live sessions big groups mm -hmm. and so what was so interesting is I was I was unfolding a concept mm -hmm. and people would not listen long enough to let me finish a sentence and say what I was saying and they would start trying to give me their point of view mm. and of course the book of Proverbs says a person like that's a fool but only only a fool speaks before he hears before he hears everything he needs to hear and so we go from that to the names of god yeah and and you know the uh, the psalmist says that god exalts mm -hmm. his word and his name above everything so yeah. god puts his name 
in the same category of his word. And if his, if his name is not true, then he is a liar. If his word is not true, he is a liar. Mm -hmm. And so we have these names of God. Now, when I study the names of God, you know, people call me and say, man, I saw this name of God. And it's like, well, no, mm -hmm. God did not give himself that name. That's just something that somebody else calls him. And if it, you know, and so I'm really, I'm really meticulous about what I will accept as a, as a biblically based name of God. Mm -hmm. But one of the primary places that people grasp the name of God is in, uh, is in the covenant names. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so the covenant names, you got Jehovah Sidkenu, which is Jehovah, my righteousness. You got Jehovah uh, Mekadesh, which is uh, the Lord, my sanctification. And then, you know, you got Jehovah uh, Shalom, which is yeah. the Lord, my peace. And so you got all of these names. And every one of these names represent the idea that in a relationship with God, based on believing his name, that this is what you experience. So you experience peace. Mm -hmm. You experience him as your shepherd leading you and guiding you. You know, you experience him as your protector. And so, so. Let me mention a prayer uh, organizer, guys. This is the yeah. main, main book we have to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prayer organizer is, is, is a great tool for learning how to pray from a biblical perspective based on who God is and who Jesus is. But anyhow, so, so when we're trying to interpret scripture and we come up with any doctrine that is in conflict with the names of God, mm -hmm. then number one, we're taking the name of the Lord in vain. Yes, yes. And because we're saying, no, it's not true. God lied about that. That's not who he is. Mm -hmm. When we blame God for things mm -hmm. that are contrary to his name, mm -hmm. we are taking his name in vain. Or we constantly say God is in control, but don't worry about nothing. God is in control. And there's, not a, scripture, form, there's not a single scripture for that anywhere. Is that form of taking God's vain, uh, name in vain? Yes. Well, that means that you have to say that the Lord, your shepherd, is not true. That's not, that's mm -hmm. not true. He's not leading me. He's just making this stuff happen to me. But you see, uh, they believe God will put you through this, but then he will take you out. So he is a shepherd. He, they're going to agree with you in that case that he is a good God. Uh, no, but that don't, that don't fly. You know, there was a story that floated around back in the 70s, how that if a shepherd had a little lamb that was kept getting away from the fold, that the shepherd would go get the lamb and break his legs and carry him so that eventually he would come to where he, you know, where the lamb would always follow the shepherd. Well, well, well first of all, I got the, you know, I, I can't find that story anywhere in ancient history. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, every animal that I've ever had, if you hurt them bad enough to break their leg, they're going to run from you every time they get a chance. They are not going to follow. So there's crazy stories and, and, and illusions that people come up with that are just, they are just not biblically based. Because the real truth is God can't be your deliverer mm -hmm. and your tormentor. Mm -hmm. So okay. to say that God is the one bringing the trouble so that he can teach you something that is in direct contradiction to so many scriptures, but it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy it, not God. God doesn't steal, kill, and destroy it so he can teach you something. When you, through unbelief, get into situations, God shows up. And people say, oh, well, you must have done this because you, you used this to teach me. No, he did. He did help you and he did teach you and deliver you from a situation, but he didn't bring it. God teaches you through his word, through his spirit. That's pretty much it. Yep. yep. So <clears throat> amen to that. I'm sorry. I don't want to take you, uh, shift you to another thing. Yep. So let me think how to put it the right way. How not to judge a person, let's say you are at the church, you don't want to judge people based on the look and stuff. How to make a difference between true believers and those that pretend to be the believers? I don't ever try to make that distinction. That's good. I was thinking because, about because we can't judge that. You know, we, we can't know what's in a person's heart. We can't know mm -hmm. if maybe right now a person is just going through a really bad time and, and they've gotten off. I mean, we just we just can't know. And so, uh, so, you know, I'm going to treat everybody pretty much the same, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not, so I'm not, I'm not going to judge if you are a, a believer or non-believer. I'm not going to judge if you're an evil person, but I'm not going to judge that you're a good person just because you live good. 
actually, if you want to know the truth, in, in churches, probably more people have been, believers have been swindled out of money by mm -hmm. passing judgments that somebody is trustworthy when yeah. they don't really know they're trustworthy so, because they're making a judgment of, of their heart. So, so there, there is, you know, Jesus never tried to decide which of his followers were faithful and true, which was weren't. He just preached what he preached and then said, if you're interested, follow me. Mm. And, that, and that's kind of, see, the church doesn't do the church. And, and again, it, I, I hate using the word church because we, we'll, we'll, we'll have to kind of nail this out. The church mm. does, the church's whole concept of success is based on the world system. It's a carnal minded sense of success that yeah. comes by how many people you get sitting in a room listening to you preach. Wow. And so, mm -hmm. and so if that is your definition for success, yeah. then every decision that you make is going to be driven primarily by what will make our church grow, mm -hmm. not what will help our people grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, and uh, let me just say this real quick. Like, and of course, you know, the ultimate, the mm -hmm. ultimate gold standard yes. for understanding the truth is look at Jesus life ministry, the way he treated people, his death, burial and resurrection. And uh, uh, that is the gold standard because, because anything that, that is in disharmony with Jesus and his life that you are saying is true, again, means you are you, you're taking the name of the Lord Jesus in vain. Wow. So many times we don't re realize how many times we take his name in vain yeah. by doing, by thinking even, not even speaking, but doing things. Yeah. Wow. So, so all of that to say, look at that. I've got to have, I got to be committed to that standard before mm -hmm. I can even start sorting out any of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So tell me, what about prayer? If I pray wrong, can I even ask for any effect, benefit of my prayer? Well, I, I you know, number one, there are so many unscriptural things taught about prayer. Yes. You know, there were several things that Jesus said, don't, don't do this when you pray. And, you know, like, don't go on and on and on. Don't right. think that because you're, because you're going on and on and on that you're going to be heard mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and those kind of things. But yet that's really how we're taught to pray. Most, I, I you know, I, I, when I first put the prayer organizer out back in the eighties. You know, I was, I was invited to conferences everywhere by some of the biggest names in the world to teach them about prayer. And, and if there was somebody else there speaking, usually the other speaker, their, their, every message they preach would be telling people to do something that Jesus said not to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I don't, you know, it's not so much that I think of prayer in, right or wrong. You know what I mean? I, I'm saying, oh, they're praying wrong. Because mm -hmm. we're not talking about foreigners. And really, that's one of the things Jesus said, don't worry about, I mean, he didn't say it in English this way. He said it in Greek this way. But basically, it was like, don't, don't worry about your formulas. It's not going to be your formulas. It's not going to be how long you pray. It's not going to be all these things. And don't even, don't, don't even worry about praying about money. Because, because, you know, God will take care of it. So, so you start realizing, if I'm not going into prayer with a basic trust of God's desire and willingness to take care of me, then how can I go in there and say that I'm praying in faith about anything else? Hmm. So the problem is not, are you praying prayer right, praying prayer wrong? And I know you didn't mean it. I'm, I'm just kind of playing off a little bit. Good, the, the, real, the real question is this, am I praying in a faith that is based on what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection? What if a person, I'm just asking from the listeners, okay, what if I don't know, someone would say, I didn't know, I don't know how to pray, I was never taught the right way, but God saw my heart, will, will he answer me? Well, mm -hmm. how many, but, look, how many Catholic people are using rosary? Yeah. They have good hearts. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't even say they have good hearts. I don't know if they got a good heart. Don't know if they got a bad heart. Don't know. Because is it a good heart if they reject the word of God? Is it a good heart if they reject the name of God? Is it a good heart if they reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? But we want to we want to say because they're nice, they have a good heart. Mm -hmm. We can't say that about each other. We can't say that about anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, sincerity mm -hmm. is not a replacement for faith. 
Wow. Sincerity. And, and you have to understand, it doesn't matter how sincere you are. The question is, are you praying or doing whatever it is you're doing in faith? Yeah. If you are doing it in faith, then you can go to a very clearly stated scriptural promise that says this is yours because you're in Jesus. Mm -hmm. so, so, so then you know that you have the right to, you know, to take hold of this. But then the second thing is this, is uh, am I praying? Is my faith about, about being able to receive this? Is that based in the fact uh, of knowing exactly what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection? Or are you just using the name of Jesus as a catch-all formula? That's big. I, some people, I remember I had this, one of our Bible schools one time, this lady, and she said, you are the most complex person I've ever met in my life. I said, no, I'm not. Really, everything I teach about this is really, really simple. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I have to go into a lot of these details is because people like you have complicated it so much. You have made it so unscriptural. You have come up with beliefs that are not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So then we have to go out here and find all of these places and show you. Here's where it is in the Bible. Here's where it is in the Bible. But you know, the great majority of the time, yeah. and I hate, man, I hate to even admit this, but I'm telling you the great majority of time, people who identify as Christians, mm -hmm. when you show them they're violating scripture, they're going to just say, well, you know what? I don't care. It's what God, this is what God showed me to do. In, but I, I, in one sense, I understand that lady. You know why? Because when I was exposed to gospel of peace and everything new, and I, I'm a worship leader, as you know, and I, I was going to lead worship and my head was so big with all this knowledge, the, yeah. the, the new things. I said, God, I don't even know how to lead worship. I know the old school, how to do this. Yeah. But, and so it was like walking on landmines. You don't want to step on them. You yeah. don't want to say the wrong things and mm. lead people in the wrong way. You know, it is challenging. At the beginning, I get her. It is complicated yeah. if our brain is so washed by religion. Well, we, we make it complicated. Well, I'm not saying we intend to. People make this stuff compl complicated because they make it they make it an intellectual issue and not a heart issue, not mm -hmm. a belief issue. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just taking all this stuff and going before God and just kind of laying it out there and saying, okay, God, I'm starting to see you in a different way. I'm, I said, I'm starting to get a pattern mm -hmm. that shows me who you are. And so all the patterns usually point back to some incredibly simple things and you know over the years i will learn something about a pattern that i identified 40 years ago mm -hmm. that that if i had tried to weave all those pieces together 40 years ago it would have probably overwhelmed me yeah. so i don't ever worry about what i don't know if i'm sure something's in the bible all i'm really saying is okay god show me show me how to bring this into knowing you show me how to how to put this in practice in real life show me whatever i need to know for this to, to work in me yes awesome wonderful uh, how about uh, i will try to ask you the right way if 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 i have a problem please help me we are taught from one one way to pray in silence I don't want to even name churches, but I've been in them. Right. The more silent, the more, uh, yes, the more, more silent, the more holy it is. Yeah. But on the other side, uh, pardon me, everybody, if I will say it. But on the other side, there are people that sound like gun machine. And if they don't scream and yep. shout, they don't think it's a prayer or it's not spiritual enough. And please yep. don't get offended, guys, because I believed that way alone for the longest time. I and then when I didn't, when I started shouting, repeating after other people, thinking now God hears me. Now I repeat it a thousand times. Then I would look at those quiet people, thinking, oh, they have no idea what prayer is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, here's um, again, see, to create a formula of any kind then you have to first create an idol in your mind. Wow. So I have, to, I have to create an image of God mm -hmm. that, that to me represents the fact that he wants me to be quiet. But that's an image of God in my mind. That, that's idolatry. That is, that's emotional idolatry. Mm -hmm. But then I might create an image of God that says, well, you know, God wants me to run and jump and twirl like and David, scream. Like David. The Bible is talking huh? about it. Like David, he was yeah. jumping and <laughs> praising. So, you know, again, people don't read the Bible for themselves. Believers, and I want to talk about believers versus Christians here in a few minutes. 
but people who identify as Christian generally don't read the Bible for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the book of Revelation, it talked, God talked about the, uh, uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and he said he hated that doctrine. He hated those who practiced that doctrine. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. the Nicolaitans, the word Nic Nicolaitan is, is a compound word, and one means to rule over or oppress the laity. Okay. And so the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that the that the uh, uh, clergy controls and dictates doctrine to the laity. Now there were other they mixed in with it the doctrines of Balaam and all that kind of stuff. But but this was the main thing that they did. They controlled people through a, a hierarchy. Now we got to remember there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus. That's it. There's, Amen. You know, I, I think we should honor our pastors. I think we should honor our elders, but we should never give to them the place that belongs only to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, all, all of my life, I would, I would do what I felt like God was leading me to do. I didn't really care who liked it, but you know, I would always search it out biblically. I would nearly always go talk to people that I deeply respect it. But I wasn't saying, what should I do? You know, I don't ever go to anybody and say, what should I do? Mm -hmm. I, I go to people and say, you know, what are my options? How do you see this? What do I need to understand about this? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go back in prayer. I'm going to make my own decision. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and if it, you know, so if, so if it doesn't work right, then this is my, some, some belief in my heart that I got to work out. Yeah. So nobody ever gets blamed for what doesn't work. And nobody ever gets credit for what does work. Yes. Because this is just, everything's between me and God. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, one of, the, one of the statements that I've made for the last four or five decades, at least four decades, is that truth is absolute, but the application of truth is 100% variable. Yes, that's good. You see, none of us are in the same circumstance. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us have the same kind of family members around us. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a situation right now with a young couple and and, uh, you know, they, they got pregnant outside of marriage. And so, you know, they're basically not bad kids. If you know what I'm saying, you know, they're not out partying and going crazy. You know, they've been dating for years. We've been planning on getting married, but I mean, it was still sin. I mean, what, what they got to do was sin. So, so the girl's family is so controlling that it is just, I don't even see how anybody can live in it, but also they know nothing about God. None of them know anything about God. So the girl's family is pushing her toward having an abortion. I oh. mean, they are on her. They're beating her down emotionally. You know, they're, they're criticizing her uh, and, you know, telling how stupid she is that she don't have an abortion. But why? Because she's too young or they hate the guy? Well, they probably just want to control the circumstance. You know, okay. they're just a family full of controllers. It's just okay. kind of crazy. How are they going to look at the eyes of that child? Well, they're not because in their mind, they haven't done anything wrong, you know. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to help people in this, because I mean, there are a lot of family members, even on both sides, yep. that are really upset with this mother and her other two daughters that keep pushing this whole abortion agenda. The father doesn't want, you know, the, the baby's father wants to keep it. Yeah. The, the girl's father is deeply opposed to abortion. So, man, I mean, this is causing chaos. But you got to remember something. You know, uh, whenever, whenever one of the greatest life lessons that Moses ever learned mm -hmm. was when he was bringing the children out of, uh, out of Egypt children of Israel. And man, he was getting frustrated with them. He was getting tired of them. He was, you know, they were stiff necked. They were rebellious. And so interesting to watch the dialogue between Moses and God, because mm -hmm. Moses, would, Moses would say to God, these are your people and you brought them out of Egypt. So what are you going to do about it? And so many times God would say back to Moses, these are your people. You brought them out. And, uh, but I wanted to deal with them. <laughs> so, Difficult. God, and I, I'm not, we don't have the time to go through, but God took Moses through three very basic phases of mm -hmm. what in the new covenant we call put off, put on. Yeah. Now, so, you know, the first thing was a didactic, it was a didactic lesson 
that mm-hmm. caused Moses to have to think objectively about the situation instead of subjectively. In mm-hmm. other words, stop thinking about how it affects you. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and God skillfully took him through a conversation about that. Much like the conversation, you remember when God told Abraham to go uh, uh, sacrifice Isaac? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you know, God had no intention of him sacrificing Isaac. God was putting him in a position where he had to deal with the fears of his heart mm-hmm. and his unbelief and his doubt. He had to decide, was he going to believe God? And it's probably there on Mount Moriah was probably where uh, the, it, it was sealed so that God could send the Messiah into the world on, and die on the cross. Wow. And if Abraham hadn't done that, God may not have ever had the legal right to do that in planet earth, but we won't go there. Wow. Wow. But uh, what's really interesting. So, so the second phase of God trying to prepare Moses as a leader was a theological mm-hmm. session. So this theological session, it's a, you can find it over in uh, Exodus 32. I can't look it up right now. I just installed a new computer. My, my Bible's not working like it's supposed to. But it's uh, Exodus 32. I don't know. Uh, you can just scroll down through there where, where um, you know, Moses is wanting to see God. He's wanting to see God's face. And so actually, he's wanting to see the glory of God. Now, you stop and think. So he's wanting to see the greatest aspect of God. That's really... When you're asking to see the glory of God, you're showing me, like, show me everything you got. <laughs> show me the best thing you got. You know? it, it, you're very close. Exo- Exodus 33 from 18 to 34. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I knew it was somewhere from 32 to 34. I, I, I didn't know where. So anyhow. Mm-hmm. First was Abraham. Moses was second, correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, so then God, mm-hmm. when he's talking to Moses before his presence passes before him. He, he, you know, he, he he is the Lord. He actually repeats his name twice. I can look it up if you want me to. But, uh, you know, but he says, you know, I, I'm forgiving. I forgive trespasses. I forgive iniquity. Da, 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 da. Have you got that scripture that you're going to read the first time? I keep talking. I'll do it in one minute. <laughs> oh, but, but, but that's all right. That's all right. We, don't, we don't need to. I just thought if you had it. So anyhow, God is saying, you know, you yeah. know, I, I am the Lord God. And so he gives two of his names, which are really yes, interesting. Yes, I know what you're talking about. And mm-hmm. then he then he starts saying, you know, you know, I'm merciful and I'm patient. Yes, yes. And, and he actually uses a Hebrew word uh, mm-hmm. um, that there is no, wor- no word in any other language in the world that mm-hmm. explains this word. You can't explain it in one word because it gets into how merciful and compassionate he is. Mm-hmm. And there, there is no one word anywhere that explains it. You see the so, Bible, so, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Bible I'm looking at, it's Exodus 22. And it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the Egypt. But again, it's different translation. I can't find the one that you're yeah. talking about. I know. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's either going to be in Exodus 32 or 34, but anyway. Okay. okay. So here's the deal. So, but then all of a sudden, it sounds like Mm -hmm. God contradicts all that Mm -hmm. because then he says, he says, uh, but I will not clear the King James says clear iniquity. Mm -hmm. And the King James says, uh, but you know, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. Mm -hmm. Well, and so people come, that's where people come up with a doctrine that is not in the Bible Mm -hmm. called generational curses. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so people will say these generational curses go, you know, go da, da. But the Bible very explicitly says there's no such thing as generational curses. It mm-hmm. it says, can the parents eat the grapes and the children's teeth be set on the edge? No. And, and he talks about how everybody will die for their own sins if, if they die. But anyhow, so it just sounds like God just contradicted everything that he said. Because, see, we think of God as a legalist. We think that God comes up with a formula, a one-size-fits-all formula for prayer, for healing, for all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and so, and if you just had the English to go by, yes. that passage of scripture would kind of sound like God's like, what? Are you, you know, are you schizophrenic? What, what is the deal here? Yes. And so what god is saying is i am merciful but when he says but i will not clear it sin yes i he is what he's saying is just because i'm merciful that does not mean that i just say it's all right yes yes I, I, i'm not gonna let it stand exodus 34 verse 6 i'm the lord 
the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Is that the one? Um, yeah. uh, no, but it's close. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's good. but anyhow, so the know. first thing he's saying is, you know, we read this and we say, how can he be compassionate and merciful and, and you know, forgiving? And, and but, but yet he's still not going to, He's still not going to let sin go. Mm -hmm. See, God is legally bound by his word. The entire universe works on one thing, and that is the credibility of God's word. Amen. Everything. Amen. And so Amen. if any, if God lies about anything or contradicts himself about anything, the real truth is the universe would, would implode. It would, it would fall apart. Yep. So then you got, okay, so, so I'm, in other words, I'm not going to just let stand. I'm going to be merciful, but I'm, that doesn't mean I'm just letting sin go. Mm -mm. You know, the fact that I'm merciful, the fact that I'm compassionate, the fact that I'm long uh says that you can come to me. I will forgive your sins, mm -hmm. but I'm not just saying it's all right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let them stand. But then the word where it says visiting the iniquity of the, you know, the fathers to the third or fourth generation, that word visiting as often as not is actually translated as remembering. Yes. Yes. And, um, and some Hebrew scholars that I study from, you know, says that what he's saying is, I'm going to remember mm -hmm. this iniquity of the fathers and how it is visiting upon you. In other words, in other words, you didn't just, one of the reasons I can be compassionate is because I'm going to realize you didn't just get up today and decide mm -hmm. to be rebellious. Yeah. This has been influenced on you by your society. This has been influenced upon you by your family. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I struggled with this for years because for years, if I knew somebody's background, I could be compassionate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with, well, am I, am I being, you know, am I being wishy-washy here? Mm -hmm. uh, but no, because God says, I know your background. I know how you got here. You didn't just decide this, you know, you didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I think I'll go destroy my life. You got here through influences and voices in your life. And mm -hmm. so God is saying, now I, I'm this merciful God that's not going to let sin stand, mm -hmm. but I also recognize how you got where you are. Mm -hmm. So now when you look at that whole concept, you're realizing there is no one model mm -hmm. for how that person solving their problems does it with god it's mm -hmm. got to be real with them they got to know who god is they got to believe he's merciful they got to believe he's compassionate they got to believe that he understands how they got there mm -hmm. and then they then they they're going to go to god based on this these promises of god i'm so glad you're talking about it because exodus 20 verse 5 i believe that's what you are explaining let me say how it says in new international version Great. I, Lord, your God, I am jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Mm -hmm. hmm. But the, the real truth is the word punish is not what the Hebrew says. Please talk about it. This is so. But again, that goes back to visiting the iniquity of the children. It's the same concept. And that word visiting is the word remembering. He is saying, I'm not going to let sin stand because I'm going to remember that it is not me. This is not even him talking about judgment or punishment. This is him saying, it is your fathers and grandfathers and, and grandmothers iniquity that they taught you and that they modeled to you. And that's why you are as unstable as you are today. So turn to me. He said, yes. turn to me. I will forgive you. I will redeem you from this mm -hmm. and, and I'll teach you how to have a life. That's so good because you thank you for repeating what you just explained. It is important because we are taught over and over backwards. Yeah. Yeah. So those thoughts will come back to us, but, 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 but God this, but God that, but well, I've seen in other scripture, God is jealous. Oh, I've seen God is angry. He will pour out his anger. Nonstop. We see it. Even my daughter who knows from the birth, uh, she knows how good the good God is good and only good. She will say, mom, look, I read this. How should I explain, uh, explain myself? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why we got to know the Bible again. Christians or believers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really the issue. Christian is just somebody that says, Oh, good. I identify, really, they're saying I identify with church. They're not really saying they identify with Jesus. They're saying mm -hmm. really they identify with church. 
And a, but a believer is the person that worked, looked at the word of God and believes it. And keep in mind, whatever you believe is what you're going to put into practice. If you're not putting it in practice, you don't believe it. It's just pretty much that simple. The word believe and obey in the Greek are synonymous. The words hear and obey in the Hebrew are, are almost synonymous. This has, but what you're talking about has potential to offend many people. Like you always, oh, yeah. truth has potential to offend you. The, the same truth that can set you free. Yeah. So we have to. And so people may be saying, well, why are you doing this? Why are you even talking about this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'm not telling you to be against your church. Mm -hmm. I am not telling you to be against your pastor, but here's what I am telling you. Mm -hmm. Your pastor, it, if your pastor is the, the paid clergyman who does the praying for you, who does the reading the Bible for you, and who you does all these things for you, then the real truth is you are in the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Jesus. You have, you have a professional hired clergy. And you say, yeah, but he's not oppressing me. Yes, he is. If he is, if he's defining God to you, mm -hmm. then on a certain level, he is oppressing you, whether he or she means to or not. So the point is, don't get mad at him. Almost every time I've ever sat down with any group of people that start telling me how the church had hurt them, how mad they are at church, usually by the time I got it unraveled, I would bring them face to face with the fact that no, they were there playing some kind of con game. They were there trying to get some kind of special position. They thought getting close to the leadership of the pastor would bring them some kind of spiritual benefit. And, and so the real truth is uh, they were the ones that sucked up to the leaders and made it an unhealthy relationship. You can't have a leader cannot have an unhealthy relationship with a person that's healthy. It's just, it's just that simple. So you can't blame the leaders for oppressing you. You can't blame the leaders for doing any of this stuff to you because you are the one, number one, if, if you're getting abused, leave. Mm. Yeah, but God led me there. No, he didn't. <laughs> God didn't lead you to go somewhere and get abused. As God's simple. not leading you to stay somewhere that you're getting abused. Leave, go somewhere else. You're just there for social reasons. Mm. So, Gee. so, uh, uh you, know, you just can't blame anybody. You can't put any responsibility on anybody else. You got to say, you know what? If I'm stupid about the Bible, and if I've got stupid beliefs, and if I'm reading, if I'm not reading it prayerfully for myself, then it's nobody's fault but mine. I am choosing to be stupid because I'm too lazy to read the Bible for myself. I'd rather let some some controlling manipulator read it and use it to control me. And me actually read it and discover the freedom I have in Jesus. Wow. Hold on. Let me think. This is mind blowing. Dr. Jim, this is mind blowing. And let me say this to leaders out there. Most, I, I, I would think that a, a great number of leaders that I met that had controlling issues, mm -hmm. they were doing what they were taught to do. They learned it in seminary. They learned it from the people that mentor them. And they think they're supposed to make decisions for people because, because they know the Bible more. They think that they're supposed to be more in control or have more influence in that life, in that person's life than Jesus does. But, you know, I don't meet a lot of guys that just started out and said, here's the way I'm going to build my ministry. I'm going to control people's lives. They don't start out that way, but they start think it's like a controlling parent that says you know if i don't control what this kid does they're gonna get in trouble well then you may need to let them get in trouble suffer the consequences mm -hmm. that'd be the biblical process so, by the way i've got a revision of a book that i'm telling you a, a book that uh mm -hmm. it calls more positive incredibly challenging issues in leadership back in the very early 90s than any other book I've written for leaders and it's called and I'm actually rewriting it right now it's called leadership builds people yes we have it translated the first volume the old, which is good awesome <laughs> we'll get all, we'll get all that we'll get all that up to date after after we get it but uh you know every every leader and I'm not trying to pick on leaders I'm just no, talking no. to you just like with anybody else yes Every leader has, by default, established mm -hmm. the, their, the beliefs that guide how they work in ministry. Yes. And there, there are two questions are, uh, are that people have, or really one question that people have answered in their heart. They may not have ever 
said it out loud. They may not even have re remembered that they made this decision. But, but really, the question that every leader has already answered is, um, uh, does, does my ministry build people? Mm -hmm. or do I use my ministry to build people? Or do I use people to build my ministry? Wow. And you're always doing one or the other. And if you're using people to build your ministry, then you, you've got a severe problem. Doesn't mean you're a bad, you know, bad person, but it means you got to work out some stuff with Jesus. You know, it's an interesting scripture over in, in John chapter 20. You know, uh, the mother of, of, of uh, the sons of Zebedee, which were called the sons of thunder, you know, she came to Jesus and said, I got a request of you. He said, all right. He, she said, well, can my son sit on your left and right hand when you come into your kingdom? And he says, I don't, he says, I don't know. They might, they might not, but he said, that's really not mine to give. That's mm -hmm. just up to the father. Yes. And, uh, uh, which if more leaders would require people to come up through the ranks of leadership based on their serving, you mm -hmm. wouldn't have leaders that come up and split your churches, try to take over your churches. When we promote people, we don't know what they're getting, what we're getting. But when people and the way they serve others becomes promotion, mm -hmm. we're able to really understand who they are as a person. But anyhow, so then Jesus goes on and he says, uh, he says, now the Gentiles, they think that leadership is exercising authority over others. Mm -hmm. now, and why don't people get this? He mm -hmm. says it shall not be so with you you know man from the 1970s through the 1990s mm -hmm. every time you joined a church you would go through a church membership class it was all about submitting to authority mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's like mm, man and so, so right off the bat we're going to explain our justification for controlling you and uh, those kinds of churches start out really really good they're very well organized but they always turn inward and 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 mm -hmm. die inwardly if you really want to know the truth mm -hmm. and so uh but but so but he goes on to say he says it shall not be so with you he says you shall not exercise lordship over anybody mm -hmm. can't do it if you're if you're a biblically based leader Wow. And then he, then he goes on to say, um, it's sort of like, I'm paraphrasing, it's sort of like he says, I don't mind that you want to be the greatest. I don't, that's all right. Mm -hmm. As long as you pursue it from a biblical perspective. Because from a biblical perspective, the person that is the greatest is the person who is the greatest servant. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to lay down your life for these people, then you do it and just see where God promotes you. But if you're not willing to lay down your life for these people, then you have no business considering yourself to be a, a biblically based spiritual leader. Because if we want to be first, we want to be noticed, appreciated, yep. means we do not have rooted identity in Jesus because we don't right. believe actually that we have it all in him. Right. So we constantly want to draw it from other sources. You know, the, the, the and I, I think some leaders listening may feel like we're picking on them, but we're not. I mean, we're telling you what's in the Bible. If, they still not watch if huh? they're still watching this. Yeah, <laughs> if, they if they're still watching it. <laughs> but, but, you know, you quoted it. Jesus said, look, he, he you know, he says, uh, uh, he said, even the son of man did not come, uh, but to, to be a servant. That's it. That's the only reason I'm here. He said, you know, I'm here to be a servant to you. And help you live the life that God has, you know, that God's promised you. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, based on what we have been taught, it's hard for a person who has come up and had control modeled to them. Yeah. It's hard for them to understand how they can even be a responsible leader if they're not in control. And, and so, so many times they are genuinely serious. They genuinely think it is my job mm -hmm. to keep these people out of trouble. Well, no, it's not. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe in a, in a future, one of these rethink church videos, we will, we will talk about what is the real commission that Jesus has given to you as a leader.
And are you doing, are you doing what Jesus explicitly stated that you are supposed to be doing? And this is all you're supposed to be doing and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people can't answer that question because they don't know what I'm talking about. They don't know what verses I'm, uh, you know, I'm referring to, mm -hmm. but, um, but stop and think about it. You know, we talked about how one wrong word you start building on it and then before long ba see based on this wrong interpretation mm -hmm. then you have to start wrongly translating and interpreting other words to make them fit with this word mm -hmm. so you know the word church and i'm pretty sure we talked about this last time but this is one of these things we'll probably talk about every single time we we talk Good. about rethinking church mm -hmm. you know the, the the word church when you say church to almost everybody they are either going to think of an organization, a denomination, or a local congregation that has a building. A theology. Certain huh? theology. And so, and so the problem is, that's not what church is. Mm -mm. So the moment you start thinking, and see, the church met in, in houses. And the, mm -hmm. by the way, it, the death of the church came, uh, it coincided with Christianity becoming legal and starting mm -hmm. to have buildings you know large buildings government support and all that kind of stuff tell me what you used to answer people when they said uh what church do you belong to or what do you believe well you know i tell them i belong to the body of christ okay because see remember right the, see the word church comes from the greek word ecclesia ecclesia mm -hmm. and the word ecclesia means to call people out mm -hmm. And, and because the model, the biblical model of the church is what happened with the children of Israel who were called out of Egypt, but they were called out to go into mm -hmm. Canaan, the mm -hmm. promised land. Mm -hmm. And so the body of Christ has nothing to do with what name is on the door, you know, with what group you're meeting with. You know, when I, when I first got saved, you know, half of my family was Baptist, half my family was Church of Christ. None of them were really very godly. They, you know, they were, most of them were main religious legalists. How did you and keep so, unity with them? Huh? How did you keep unity with them? Uh, I think, again, I think unity is one of those words that we have a false definition of. We have a false concept of what unity looks like. Please tell you know, me. It's, it's just real simple. I'm going to be kind to them, mm -hmm. but if, if it's not in the Bible, if you can't show it to me in the Bible, and I'm not talking about just pulling a, a verse or two out of context, mm -hmm. you got to show it to me. I'm going to look at the original language, all that kind of stuff. Then mm -hmm. I'm not going to believe it. If I don't, if I don't see it in the Bible, I'm not going to be mad at you. You can believe it. That's what you want to believe. <laughs> so my aunt, I'd been saved not very long, just a few months. And so my aunt, and she loved me and she thought she was doing something. Else. I get a call one day and she's like, Jimmy, you know, she, when I was a kid, they called me Jimmy. So my older relatives would call me that. Yeah. And she said, Jimmy, she said, I just want you to know, I appreciate the change in your behavior, but you're still going to hell. <laughs> and I said, really? Well, why am I going to hell? She said, because you don't go to the right church. Oh, you don't go, you don't go to the church of Christ. Oh. And so I, I said, you know, maybe I need to come over. We need to talk. So I went over there and I did not go to argue. I went over there to talk with her. And, you know, uh, I would go to scriptures about, about being born again, and she would go to scriptures and about baptism. And, you know, because they believe you get saved by getting baptized, and they believe that you stay saved by, by legalism, you know, you know, by dead works. And so, uh, and so, interesting thing, the church of Christ don't believe you can know mm -hmm. if you're saved. Mm hmm and so, you know, I would just walk her down this path of, well, wait a minute, I know I'm saved. She said, well, you can't know you're saved. And I would show her scriptures that said you could know you're saved. <laughs> and so I never attacked her, never fought with her. And so, you know, at the end of it, we ended the conversation with, I'm like, okay, so you don't even know for sure that you're saved, but you're sure that you're right. And you want me to believe, take the word of somebody who has no clue if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here. I got the Bible to back me up. I know for a fact that I am saved, mm -hmm. but you're not going to listen to me. Mm. So, you know, that's that. But, you know, with those kinds of people, you just walk away. You have to, you know, the Bible says many times, it sounds ruthless. Many times it talks about God giving people over to okay. a particular mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like he is making this happen. He's making it get worse. You know, right. no, 
It does. He is just saying, I have, you know, I've called you, I have wooed you, you know, I have sent people to share with you, I've sent people to minister to you, I've done everything I can to help you, and I can't violate your will, so if this is what you want, I'm, I have to let you get it. Yes, let's understand that, people. Yeah. I just want to say it. And so about- they're going to do that, they're going to they're gonna go get it. You ain't got nothing to do with that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Talk about unity in churches among different denominations. We hear sometimes when pastors meet together from Baptist, from Pentecostal or this or that church, and they want to do something together or at least not fight. Well, most of the time, the concept of unity Mm -hmm. is developed around compromise. Compromise. In other words, if, if, if enough people that disagree, if they will compromise on certain things that they say that they believe, mm-hmm. then, okay, then we can get along. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the church has bought into that for, for decades or actually for centuries, mm-hmm. you know, thinking you could appease the government, thinking you could appease an atheist, thinking you could appease somebody else. If you just kind of, kind of agree with them in some mm-hmm. area, give up some belief in some area, you know, unity uh, first of all, unity is something that happens by the Holy Spirit. It does not happen because you intellectually or mentally come into agreement on things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm all right with the fact that let's, uh, one of my teachers in college used to say major on the majors, minor on the minors. If it is an important doctrine related to salvation, related to knowing God or that sort of thing, then I'm not going to move on it. I'm not going to be fighting you about it all the time. I don't have any need to fight you or prove my position, right? But I'm not going to move on it. And if you're asking me, if you're telling me I've got to give that up in order for us to be friends, and we just won't be friends. Uh, if you had a church and a Pentecostal church and Baptist would approach you and say, can we cooperate, work together on certain projects, would you? Well, I would have to get, uh, I'd have to get a lot of information about what are these projects. In the name uh, what, of unity. What is the goal and how are we going to accomplish that goal? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, uh, and I've done a lot of cooperative efforts with churches here in my city over the years, okay. but most of them ended up uh, going shipwreck. shipwreck. You know, in other words, they crashed and burned on the shores of truth yeah. because once you would get to some some truth that one of the groups didn't like, then they're going they're going to blow it up. Mm. So you think you were you you from your side you would be open, but you feel like they would not be able to handle that. Right. It right. would cost them too much to give up. The more you know, the less a person has an intimate relationship with God, mm. then the less they have the assurance of salvation. Mm. The assurance of salvation is not a doctrinal position again it's a work of the holy spirit the holy spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god the holy spirit and we're sealed by the holy spirit so all the factors that have to do with assurance of salvation are related to how we interact with the holy spirit Mm -hmm. and so you know you get a person that really doesn't have real intimacy with god they don't you know they're i'm not saying they're not good people anything like that but but they really are not having a living intimacy that that person's always going to be secure and so if you don't have security about your salvation through your relationship with god you will try to find it through your doctrine Mm. and so then if anybody challenges your doctrine then emotionally you feel like your salvation is being challenged and it's not uh okay talk about wave of prophecies on end times that uh, we see it seems like they are rising we have more and more prophets that show up at the churches or online however whenever and they talk what's going to happen well first of all fortunately i'm seeing some people that i think are being prudent wise about this and they're not claiming that they're a prophet you know they're, they're just saying look all i know is this this is a dream i had or this is something i, I i'm all right with that okay mm-hmm. but um uh, but you have to realize number one there are i don't even remember how many thousands 
a very clear prophecies that we we have more prophecies about the second return of Jesus than we do about all the other prophecies in the Bible combined. And so, so we've already got a prophetic word. And so it kind of makes me a little bit uncomfortable when people start wanting to have a prophetic word about something God's already said, it's already settled. Mm -hmm. And if that prophetic word disagrees with God's prophetic word, then I'm, I'm kind of done with them. I ain't going to fight with them. I'm just going to walk away. Usually prophecies that you hear are either very negative that yeah. all destroyed Armageddon is coming or the big revival is coming and God's going to rebuild everything. Yeah. And people ask me often, how should I approach Abby? What should I listen to it? I wouldn't listen to any of them. I don't listen to any of them. Wow. If I've got a Bible that tells me what's going to happen, mm. why am I looking to somebody besides God? See, that goes back to that whole Nicolaitan attitude of saying, I've got a Bible that tells me everything I need to know, but you know what? I'm going to go to some overseer. I'm going to go to somebody that's anointed to tell me what I need to know because I don't really trust what's in the Bible. Well, I know that sounds pretty tough, but no, that's, that's my position. Good. That's good, but most, most of those prophets, they do base their uh, prophecy on the Bible. They will mention scripture. That makes it very look like it's very believable. Yep. Well, you know, number one, we have no model mm -hmm. of New Testament or New Covenant prophecy okay. and prophets functioning like Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of what we actually literally know about New Testament prophets mm -hmm. are more along the lines of like Agabus, the prophet, you know, he, he kept warning Paul by yeah. the Holy Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem, don't. And so what we seem to see in the New Testament, and it says it twice in the book of Hebrews, it says it once and then it's like it almost repeats it within another two verses. And he says, you know, uh, and we, you know, we assume that Paul wrote Hebrews, and there's a lot of reasons to assume that, but we'll right. just say the writer of the book of Hebrews, he says, uh, he says, uh, mm -hmm. no more shall any man teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for we shall all know him from the great, first to the last, or greatest to the smallest, like that. And he says, because he's going to write all of his law and his commandments on your heart. Mm -hmm. And so in the new covenant, uh -huh. We are not designed Hebrews to 8. be looking for other people mm -hmm. to try to show us how to know God or know what God's going to do. He says, you do that for yourself. Now, you, you don't know more shall every man teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hebrews and so, 8, 11. so that to me, okay, then that's my, one of my starting places. Yeah. I'm not against the fact that somebody might share something, but I'm not looking for it. I'm not expecting it i don't feel any need for it yeah. but i don't despise prophecy either mm -hmm. you know somebody says they have a word so but let me say this so it seems like most of the gifts of the holy spirit mm -hmm. that 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 were used mm -hmm. in the old covenant to direct israel remember israel is a type of the church so I have to look at how all of these typologies are implemented in the church so you know, pro apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, all these people, and all these gifts of the Holy Spirit, they are not being used to influence nations now. They're being used to influence individuals. Mm. So it was more like a personal prophecy mm. that Agabus was giving Paul mm. and the few places that we see prophecies brought forth. But we, you know, we don't really see you know, this is God telling you everything that's going to happen. I'm not saying that none of those are valid. I am just saying I don't need them, mm -hmm. but I, but I'm open. I'm not going to despise prophecy. If I hear a prophecy, I, I'm going to go, okay, God, I don't know what to make of this. I'm going to put this on the shelf and I'm going to, you know, if there's something here I need to see, uh, I, you know, I, I want to see it. Me, but, you know, let me just share this. If people are going to call themselves a prophet, are they going to, well, they're willing to try to stand under the scrutiny that the Bible says. The Bible says, okay, if you call yourself a prophet and you prophesy something that doesn't come to pass, then you need to be put to death. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, they all come, oh, well, that was the Old Testament. Yeah, uh -huh. but you're calling yourself a prophet. And uh -huh. Old Testament's where it all comes from. So, so you know, it kind of gets a little flaky. But let me tell you, let me show you the paradox. Now, 
in uh, 82, I believe it was, uh, man, I was, I was just going through a kind of a personal upheaval of God just bringing me into all kinds of transformation. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I, I had some very foundational stuff mm -hmm. all the way back to 72 and very clear, you know, I was pursuing God, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but about 82, man, God started challenging me to face things. I didn't even know I needed to face. I mean, I'm not talking about like sin things. Like, I'm just talking about beliefs. I'm talking about ideas, how he was leading me, what I was supposed to do in the ministry, all these kinds of things. And I'm telling you almost every major thing mm -hmm. that I was implementing mm -hmm. to fulfill my call, God said, no, nope, can't do it that way. And so nobody came and told me that. It was just God speaking to me. And so I reshaped my whole ministry. Well, that's why mm -hmm. today we are reaching millions of people a day all over the world mm -hmm. because I yielded to that. And, you know, and I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But anyhow, so one morning there was a there was a old Pentecostal prophet that came through Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And I despise this guy, if you want to know the truth. He was one of those guys that, you know, he... he a lot of the old Pentecostal prophets, they live by that concept of, well, we'll start out in the flesh and end up in the spirit. Oh, so, yeah. you know, they would just start saying stuff over people. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, of and, course. And, you know, and there was, they had no idea if it's God or not God. And, and a lot of times, sure enough, at some point, mm -hmm. they might tap into the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I hated that kind of stuff. I just despised it. I thought it discredited God. I thought it misled a lot of people. I was taught it's walking by faith. You just start speaking. So just like speaking in tongues, you start speaking and then maybe Holy Spirit will take over. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't buy that version of faith because faith is about knowing, about not knowing. guessing. Wow, good. Mm -hmm. Always. So, so when anyhow, I, <laughs> I get up. And so the Lord speaks, I'm getting ready. And this was, this was right after I got healed. Mm -hmm. uh, from this, this, or actually, no, it was just before I got healed, this kidney disease. And so... Um, I'm getting ready, and the Lord speaks to my heart and says, go find Brother Bell. And I thought, I'm not going. No. I do not. I do not want to talk to this guy, God. I, I'll do, you know, I've, I've done everything you've ever wanted me to do, no matter how humiliating. But I don't, I don't want to talk to this guy. Oh, my. And so me and God kind of had a little communication yeah. there. So yeah. finally, I'm like, all right. So I had to call around because nobody knew where this guy was. Mm -hmm. He had a little camper on the back of a pickup truck. And so he would come to an area like ours. He would go find an old, a house that was caving in or a church that was caving in, didn't have a bathroom, didn't have water. And he, that's where he would stay when he was in the area. Oh. And so somehow or another, somebody had an idea of where he was staying. So, mm -hmm. so I take off to go, to go see this guy. Now on the way out there, I, there, there are, there are a couple of decisions that I've got to make and, and it's absolute. I've got to make them now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, uh, on the way out there, I'm talking to God about this. And, and one of the biggest things I was praying about was me and Brenda. Oh. Like, I mean, we were deeply, deeply, deeply in love, but we, you know, we made some compromises and in, in coming together, you know, you know, and so, uh, so I thought, okay, God, you, you know, if, if, if I, if I've destroyed the possibility of us, of us being able to have a life together, I will, I will leave her. I'll take care of her financially for the rest of her life. And, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it is, you know, you're leading me to do. And so I, I was praying about that. Thank you, darling. I was praying about that on the way out there. So I get out there and find this guy and uh, he's just the funniest looking little guy you've ever seen. You know, he, he probably came about to my chin okay. and he was as round as he was tall. <laughs> and you know, just everything about him was bizarre looking, you know what I mean? And, and funny looking. And so, man, I just had to suck down my pride. And, uh, and so, so I knocked on the door, he comes and, you know, he's all sleepy. Eye. I got crust in his eyes, you know, and, and he'd been sleeping on the floor in this old abandoned church building in a sleeping bag. And so I said, I said, you know, I, I hope it's all right that I came here to talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, what's your name? I said, my name is Jim Richards. And I said, I got up this morning. The Lord spoke to me to find you. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, I'm, I'm not telling you anything about me. Right. I said, we're not going to play that game where mm -hmm. I give you little hints. Uh -huh. And then you start making up stuff and calling it prophecy. 
Yeah. And of course he was kind of like, what? <laughs> so I, I go in and, and so we talk for a few minutes and. Uh, you just told him that straight and he didn't get oh, yeah. up yet? No, he didn't, give a, he didn't care. He was a rough old dude. He was, old, you know, he was one of the most tough ministers, you know. <laughs> so we go in, we, we spend a little bit of time praying together. Mm -hmm. And so he, uh, this is this funny. I was standing up before we said, so he wanted to put his hands on my hand. Oh, yeah. But I was too tall. So he was <laughs> jumping. He, he was trying to get it. And so finally, I sat down on a five gallon paint bucket. If I sat down and held my hands up, he could reach them. And so, you know, there was all kinds of funny things like that happening. We could have easily gotten off track. I, I'll just tell you that. So, anyhow, so I sit down. He puts his hands on me. We continue praying. And so he starts prophesying. And he starts with when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day. I mean, nobody, I, nobody, my family didn't know this. Nobody knew this about me. When I was four years old, I was out in the backyard one day playing. And, you know, I didn't know anything about God. I, I don't know where I even came up with this. But, uh, you know, back in the 50s, you burned your garbage. So you take your garbage down every day and burn it. And so, um, so there was a, a, a rectangular shaped cardboard box that I was supposed to throw into the fire. Mm -hmm. I walked out in the backyard and I stood that rectangular cardboard box up like a podium mm -hmm. and yeah. got behind it. Right. Looked up into heaven and right. just said, God, I don't know what you want to do with me. Mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Never told anybody about that. Mm -hmm. And I knew all of my life, I knew there was something sacred about that moment. But I still didn't, I never told people. And you remember. Yeah, he described that whole event. Wow. And then, you know, he goes kind of through major events in my life, good and bad, that had set my life off course, set my life on course. And, uh, and I just actually, I just got out of the hospital uh, where they were working on my kidneys. And, uh, and he, you know, he, so he's going through this whole thing about, you know, you're sick and I see this. And he says, I see you in the hospital. And he said, and your dad showed up. Mm. And, and you haven't seen your dad in years have you i said no he said well you know the reconciliation is going to come between you and your dad wow. so and you were like he goes oh. through he goes about two hours wow i'm telling you every single now he wasn't like this with most people but i didn't let him do that start in the flesh and end in the spirit it was like get it right or i'm gone wow. and so he he might, might not have been two hours might have been an hour and a half i don't know but it went on and on and on and on and on and so when we get to the end of it, he, he stops. So we think it's all over and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to get and leave. He's wait, wait a minute. He said, and you were talking to God on the way out here mm -hmm. about your relationship with your wife. Mm -hmm. And he said, God says, despite the mistakes you made, it was his hand that brought you together mm -hmm. and you're supposed to be with this woman. So I don't despise prophecy, but I am not going to play these goofy little hint, hint and tell games. You know what I mean? Yes. Wow. So, you know, I've had some great experiences with, you know, with prophecy, but again, I'm just not going to do it foolish. But see, stop and think about it. The only reason God would need to come to somebody and reinforce something and I do always believe that prophecy is always a reinforcement, yeah. New Testament prophecy. Now, it's a reinforcement or a clarification of what God is already telling you. Mm -hmm. and, and so if God's got to tell me through an individual, that means I'm not listening for myself. Mm, that's big. And so, so, you know, my thing is I'm going to listen to God. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and, but if I'm not, hearing and responding to God properly, send somebody to me. I'll, I'll listen to them. And, uh, and if we're stupid, I'll just go, okay, God, whatever you want to do with that, go ahead. That's amazing. Very good. You know, Dr. Jim, it's so good to listen to you. I respect your time. I don't want to stretch it. Um, it's a lot to ponder. I just listen. I, I don't want to give you too many questions. I you know, we'll go as long as you want to go. I don't want to go so long that the people... We'll have to more. dive out but that's but yeah. you know your you know your people you're ministering to so whatever you want yeah i have just one question one more question just maybe in closing uh let me think 
three. Okay, just I'll ask you just one. I have a list. Um, tell me, talk to people, not me. Talk to people who come with prayer requests almost on daily basis, or I see them. Abby, pray for this. Or guys, church, pray for this. Pray for this. Pray for this. Pray for this. Just talk to them. You know, um, or oh, unspoken but, prayer, unspoken yeah. prayers. Oftentimes they won't say what. You know, I think an unspoken prayer generally gets an unspoken response. <laughs> Mm. In other words, uh, most of how we do a lot of things about prayer, mm -hmm. number one, we pray for things that Jesus said, don't pray about this. Mm -hmm. Number two, we pray for things in ways that Jesus said, don't pray this way. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, we, we don't follow the new covenant model for prayer most of how people pray are based on the old covenant and uh, uh and number four uh jesus modeled in his ministry in his life the way to pray and you won't ever see him begging god for anything mm -hmm. uh I, what i'm gonna say i almost like to hate, it, like to hate to say it it's just gonna sound so harsh uh we'll try to handle it well, you know, if people will listen to me, even if they get offended, they'll listen to me. Maybe we can help you start building your faith in God, and stop having so many disappointments. I don't think you have any biblical basis for taking prayer requests about somebody you have a burden for to somebody else. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, um, uh, my thing is this, if I know the person, mm -hmm. if they're a family member, if they're a family member, I have a certain, really a certain sort of delegated authority in their life, that, that, that there's certain things I know that I can do without violating their will. Uh, of course, which is another thing you got to remember, God will not violate anybody's will. You ask somebody to pray a prayer to get God to make them do something or, you know, force them into something, you're, you're wasting your time because God can't answer that prayer. Mm. But uh, that's uh what i used to do as a pastor when people would come to me and say uh, uh I, I want you to pray about my nephew i'm and i would say you know what you pray yep. i'll agree uh -huh. <laughs> right. and and so you know i would ask them what sometimes they just look at me like i was crazy now so i said well what what scripture are you basing this prayer on they, well, say, I don't know. I, they will say i already prayed now you that's why i brought no. it to you <laughs> and that's where you're like you know what then you got to have confidence in your faith mm -hmm. it sounds cruel but all of that is really a lot of religious activity that you don't yeah. have any scriptural basis for you don't i mean you know paul would say i prayed for you for this church or different groups um but but you don't find people praying a bunch of anonymous prayer requests. And, mm -hmm. and you know, ministries, particularly the Pentecostal and Word of Faith and Charismatic Ministries, you know, they kind of use that, that doctrine as a way to do fundraising. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they would, they would, everybody that sent in a gift, you know, they would take their prayer request and send it in front of a camera and put that bag down and lay hands on it and pray some kind of vague nebulous prayer that you don't even know what they're talking about. But people who, who that, that were, again, they were following the Nicolaitan doctrine. You have an a, anointing I don't have. You have authority that I don't have. So, so they would gladly send their money to those people Yes. to get them to pray for them, mm -hmm. thinking that those people had greater anointing. All that stuff is occult. I mean, uh, every bit of that either came out of the Nicolaitans or it came out of the Gnostics or it came out of some occult, occult background of people having better anointings than you. Nobody has a better anointing than you do if you're in Jesus. And please check two sessions I did. We have two parts of uh, the elusive anointing. It's on my YouTube channel. Don, Dr. Jim explained that in an incredible way. Please do see it. And the link will be in the description. Yeah. Continue. So, you know, to, you know, some people would think I'm just being negative about, you mm -hmm. know, some of these traditions we have. I'm saying, no, I'm being positive about doing things the way the Bible says do them. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. That's good. Awesome. You really answered. If people's hearts are open, they go, their life will be changed after just this session. Oh, yeah. Absolutely.
There will start be. praying for yourself. When you start praying for yourself, you start hearing for yourself. Mm. And so you just enter into a whole new dimension of knowing and relating to God. Everything gets better when you assume responsibility for the things that God says you should be responsible for. Yes, yes. And if you are a leader and you've heard things that just really stepped on your toe, that's okay. If you are a regular believer and you have open hearts, you've heard so much that if we apply today's session to our lives, they will be transformed and our families. Will Absolutely. Be transformed. Absolutely. Our marriages, our relationship with the children, yep. with everybody. And you know what? We're going to gain Dr. Jim peace. Yep. Absolutely. You know what? You got peace and trouble mm -hmm. in your heart when you have walked through stuff with Jesus. You know, I got a, I got a, a doctor friend of mine and and he always, he, he says, uh, you know, he always says, you know, the five foolish versions, they were the ones that went to their pastor to pray for him. I, you know, I, if, if something is happening with God, I don't want to have to go to anybody. I want to be able to hear from God for myself. And, you know, and, and, you know, if we're going to get raptured right now, I don't want to have to go ask somebody what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to know <laughs> what I'm supposed to be doing. But if somebody, if I need a miracle in my family, I don't want to have to call somebody. I want to call Jesus mm -hmm. and uh, I, I want to solve these problems now. Mm -hmm. And then I'll grow in my own heart. I'll become more confident and more peaceful. Yes. Just like you say, you really hardly, you never, I, as long as I know you, you've never asked, oh, pray for something, something. That doesn't mean you don't have problems, issues. Right. <laughs> you talk about your problem after the victory. Right. I always <laughs> wait for the victory. You know, sometimes asking people to pray for you about something, that might just be a, that might be a culturally accepted way to gossip about what you're worried about. <laughs> but on the other side if somebody will post a prayer request we do not condemn that person we do oh. not judge we don't laugh we don't mock <laughs> yeah. what we do i mean i'll pray if people send me a prayer request i'm gonna pray and but i'm gonna get in my heart i'm gonna, I'm gonna do it as much as i can and have real faith for, you know for the situation um mm -hmm. uh, but uh uh so we're, we you know we're not against that but, but i want to condemn you for it we just want you to learn to do these things for yourself mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Just a mic drop, Dr. Jim. Thank you yep. so very much. Until, you are welcome. Until I see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Shalom. All right. <laughs>